We're now working with uh, 10 Turn Abbey, and I want to show you real quickly um, what the structure looks like. Now, these are more modern images, more modern photographs, obviously, of the structure. And yet, this is, believe it or not, pretty much what Wordsworth would have seen in 1800 when he, uh, when he was walking, in pre-1800, when he was walking around this area. The cathedral roof, as you see, already gone. And these are some of the images of Ten Turn Abbey. An old cathedral where now moo cows live in the pasture areas right around it. No kidding. You can go to Southern Wells and uh, visit this site. Lots of people do. Obviously, lovers of Wordsworth and especially this poem do. Uh, here are some of the uh, other images collected off the net. Uh, this, of course, is the uh, graveyard just adjacent to the site. Another, an, another uh, picture, another perspective. This is from inside the cathedral, okay? So grass growing on the floor. Obviously, all the stained glass now long since removed. The roof long since removed. This, by the way, is the way it would have looked when Wordsworth himself was visiting Ten Turn Abbey. The abbey was no longer used as a house of worship anymore. Another picture from inside, although obviously the architecture is quite remarkable. Uh, and then parts of the architecture completely gone now. Uh, again, you can see the circular uh, circular area there where stained glass used to be gone. Uh, you thought I was kidding. I wasn't. It, only in Europe, right? They let cows kind of live on the sacred sites. This, you know. So uh, there you go. See the cows, and so you got a cows and churches all together. This is a picture of what Tintern Abbey is believed to have looked like before it was, you know, it went through its, its destruction. Do you see that river right to the uh, side of it there? That's the River Wye that we'll be talking about in a moment. Uh, um, there's a there's a an aerial view of it. And to some degree, this is kind of like the type of, a, of more of an image from a perspective that Wordsworth would have had once up on a mountaintop as he was looking down. The river Y running next to it. A final image there as well, okay? So there you go. Um, just some introduction to uh, Ten Turn Abbey. I, say, I, I share that with you because... I have a tendency to think that uh, a lot of times if you don't have a sense of what it is he's looking at, it's difficult to get any real appreciation of why this is such a big dog deal to him that now he's been away and now he's back. What I want to do now is be with you on page 784, and we're now going to go back to uh, Ten Turn Abbey. Yesterday I introduced you to Romanticism, uh, and then I read the play, uh, the poem for you. Today we exegete. So I'm going to go back. Now, I, I realize I, I, I don't have as much time as I would like to do this. Uh, and I want to try and get this done in, in, a, in a one setting. So I'm going to have to move rather quickly through the poem. And yet, I think I can do that. The place to start is Plato. One of the reasons why last September, October, we spent time with Plato's Republic is because his ideas have such tremendous influence on thinkers to come. None no more important than a, a writer like Wordsworth. When we were playing that game yesterday, remember this two-box thing, what Plato called, remember, he called it the theory of the forms, right? That is to say, there's a dualistic view of the world for Plato that says there's this, there are these images of or related to the five senses, and then there's these what he called forms, what we today call concepts, or what Emerson called ideas. I, uh, Emerson didn't like the term transcendentalism. He liked to call himself an idealist. When he used that term, he was referencing it in a philosophic way. In other words, we have, remember, uh, we, have the, we have beautiful bodies, right? And then we have this concept of beauty itself. You'll remember this. We have dollar bills. The world is too much with us late and soon, getting and spending. And then there's this thing called value. We've given our hearts away, a sordid boon, and all of that. There is, remember, Ruthie's tree, and then there's this thing that we will call nature or energy, or I'm going to go ahead and put the word spirit up here, um, and also soul. For, Immers, uh, for Wordsworth, all of those words are interchangeable in this poem. Got me? But here's the thing, and this is an, an important part to understanding romantics. They're very much about this box. Okay, which is why we begin the box five years have passed five summers with the length of five long winters. And once again, he comes back to and notice all the things he lists. They are things that would all appear in this first box. The water, the mountains, the trees, 
copses or just trees or what, hedges in England, they divide up property by growing hedges really densely packed together. And if you're up on top, it actually can look like a checkerboard, the way that they divide up the property. Okay, that's what he's talking about. So all of those things are here, okay? But then what romantics will do is they will take this information from the first box and they will seek to understand better ideas from the second box, okay? And that's the project of Tintern Abbey, and that's why it becomes such an influential poem, because what Wordsworth will do is so philosophically, beautifully, he will move from the first box to the second box. Let's watch how he does that. Again, I said yesterday, this is a tripartite poetic essay, where we work with tense, first, past, then, present, Finally, future at the end of the poem as he speaks these spe special lines with his sister Dorothy, you'll remember who is there, reminding you, Wordsworth identifies and embraces that he is an old fart. He is old when he is working with this poem. That time is past, and all its aching joys are now no more, and all its dizzy raptures, he will say, about being young. He is an old fart now. Dorothy is young. Okay, and so there will be a youth old age project going on as well. All right, let's go to it quickly. You've now seen, obviously, once you've seen a picture of Ted Turn Abbey, you can understand the painting on 785 much better, right? Um, and for those of you who are going to travel, um, you know, you land at Heathrow in London, and then you get a car easily. You can, you know, you can just get a rental car, and you can drive, you know, down south pretty quickly, and you can go, you can go see a place like this, okay, uh, in, 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 in Wales. Notice time has passed, five years. And he will list in the first 22 lines all of the things he's coming back to over related to the first box, right? Put a note to yourself. I won't go into detail here because I got to get onto the poem. But put a note to yourself in your annotations the ways in which he solicits all of the five senses what you can see, what you can taste, what you can smell, what you can hear. On and on it goes. All five of these sense reflections now are being employed to basically say in 23 lines, I'm back, I'm back. I'm back to a place that I have missed for a long time. I've been gone for five years. Now this begs a really interesting question at 3B because this is what we call a poem of place, celebrating a single place. I mean, you can see the pictures are pretty amazing. Being there in person, going away, coming back, saying, wow, I'm so glad I'm back, begs a really intriguing question. In the almost now 20 years of your life, do you have a single place, physical place, a geographic place, that for you is the place you would like to think you could come back to, and it would give you a good memory, not a bad memory, a good memory. For some of you, that may be in a structure, maybe even in the very house you grew up in. For others of you, that may be some place outside of your, you know, outside of structures, it might be in nature itself. It might be a spot in the Badlands. It might be a place on the mountain, wherever it would be. About that place, imagine that you don't get to see it for five years. Okay, that's the essence of this poem. And then he comes back to it. Now that he's back to it, he's ready to say something philosophically about being back in this special geographic location. And lest we miss it, now I'm at the top of 786, and lest we miss it, you have a, a pure Platonist reference happening. Notice what he says about all of these different things, the beautiful river Y, the trees, the copses, uh, you know, the, the little, the little um, huts where the little smoke coming up uh, out of the hut, you know, where the hermit or the individual lives alone. These, look what he says, it's top of 786, these beauteous See? And there's the word. So if you're, if you're any kind of an intelligent reader, and romantic writers kind of assume an intelligent audience, uh, there it is, okay? He's playing Plato's game. These beauteous forms, through a long absence, he hasn't been there for five years, right? Have not been to me as is the landscape to a blind man's eye. Can you put it in your own words? What's he just said poetically? Even though I've been away from this place for five years, this landscape has not been like a blind man. It, what does he mean by that? Any idea what he means by this? It is familiar because why? He can call it up in his mind, right? But oft, often is our word, in lonely rooms 
and mid the den, den is the word sound, of towns and cities. I've owed to them in hours of weariness, sensation sweet, uh, felt in the blood, and felt along the heart, and passing even into my pure mind with tranquil restoration. Um, those of us who were raised in cities are unaccustomed to the silence of towns. The first time I visited this small village, uh, I couldn't sleep that night. And they were so excited that I was here, you see. And uh, what, did you, what do you think? And I said, well, I couldn't sleep last night. What do you mean you couldn't sleep? I said, it's too quiet. What do you mean it's too quiet? I said, well, in the city, there's noise all the time. At 3 a.m., there's all kinds of traffic on the interstate at 3 a.m. Obviously, the question that came to me was, what would anyone be doing at 3 a.m. on the interstate? Everyone should be at home in bed. You see, this is obviously the, the provincial question. Uh, in the city, there is constant din. There is constant noise. We will make a city, rural, or country dis, dis, uh, kind of uh, declension here, right? He says, when I was stuck in the city, in lonely rooms, man, oh, man, do college students appreciate this. There will be a point, I promise you, in that first semester where you're just going to sit in your dorm room and go, Really? What was I, what am I doing here? Uh, and you will feel extremely lonely. I mean, it's just the essence of being in a lonely dorm room all by yourself. He says, when I was stuck there, I used these forms, this beautiful place, to allow me to do what? We'll go back and look at the lines again. I've owed to these forms in hours of weariness, sensations sweet felt in the blood and felt along the heart and passing even into my pure mind with tranquil restoration. Now this is a fundamental romantic uh, idea. This poem becomes kind of the bedrock foundational romantic poem. If you want to talk about English romanticism, you always come back to Ten Turn Abbey. What is it to restore an old car? What does that mean? To restore an old car means what? What happened to the car? It was new, then it dilapidated, and when you restore it, what do you do? You take it back to its former state. That's what the word restoration means. What has he just said about his mind? Now, this is an interesting argument. He says, when my mind becomes dilapidated, I can restore my mind by going back to this spot in my mind. I don't have to physically be here, although he's obviously very happy to be there. He said, I, I didn't have to when I was stuck in the city. I could immediately go back to this spot. Feelings, too. I'm at uh, line 30. Feelings, too, of unremembered pleasure. Such, perhaps, as have no slight or trivial influence on that best portion of a good man's life. Now, this is an intriguing question. How do you know, when it comes to the end of your life, that you have lived a good life? Wordsworth's ready to tell you. And, of course, in lines that become really popular after he publishes this poem. I've had many students who, in fact, memorize this little line and use it as a benchmark to determine whether they're living a good life or not. Look at what he calls a good man's life. Notice his little, nameless, unremembered acts of kindness and of love. Now, this is an interesting idea and argument. We have a tendency to think of the great people who have lived Obviously, the Steve Spielberg film Lincoln that some of you will pick up plus points for while you're watching it will remind you of the great individuals that have lived because they did great things. Wordsworth says, not at all. The greatest lives are defined not by big things, but go back and look at the line again. Little, nameless, unremembered acts of kindness and love. Now, that's an interesting idea. Your life will not be remembered because you did something great, something people remember. That will not determine the quality of your life as being well-lived, a great life. For Wordsworth and Romantics, the greatness is in the simplicity. My heart leaps up when I behold a rainbow in the sky. It's a childlike insight. Now this begs a really intriguing 3B question. Yesterday, did anyone in your life do a little, nameless, unremembered act of kindness or love for you? See, if you'll think about it, we have a tendency to not notice these events because we expect them to always be done, right? 
So for example, most of you ate a meal yesterday. You didn't make that meal. Someone else made it for you, right? It is interesting to ask about your own biography, how many meals you ate and pushed away from a table and ran off, never thanking the individual who made the meal for you. Provided for you the little nameless unremembered acts of kindness and love. This poem has a tendency to awaken in us. It makes us feel really stupid, naive stupid, because we kind of start to realize my whole life has been building blocks, one on top of the other, and most of the blocks I didn't put there. Somebody else was doing it for me, and I never said thanks. It's, it reminds me of the student who said, I got the total story for this. Uh, I'm a senior, and uh, now I'm, uh, I'm coaching little girl volleyball. But she said, it's just insane, a bunch of six-year-olds, and I'm supposed to coach them all in volleyball. It's like herding cats, she said. You know, and you're talking, and they're all talking, and then you're explaining, and they're not listening, and then, of course, they're crying because the ball hits them in the face or whatever. You know, and, uh, and so there you are. You, and by the end of the first night, she said, I had this horrific headache, and then they all just run off. And, it, you know, and then it hit me, she said, Oh, yeah, when I learned volleyball, this is the way I learned, too. And it never occurred to me that was some kid who would much rather be at home probably doing homework or playing video games or whatever, uh, and instead is stuck in a gym with a bunch of kids like me who don't listen. Uh, but see, this is kind of the way it works. As we age, we start to recognize the little nameless unremembered acts of kindness and of love that have been done for us. I should point out to you that you live with people it's probably not a bad idea in the last few days to at least, at least consider saying at least one time, thank you. I mean, you ought to at least try it once to say, look, I, I really need you to hear me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for what you've done. Um, here pretty quickly, you got to go. Think about that. Right? Question two, more intriguing. Can you write down one little nameless, unremembered act of kindness or love you committed yesterday? Now, this is more intriguing. We like it when people do little nameless, unremembered acts of kindness and of love for us. If you're like most people, you have a tendency to like to do little nameless acts of kindness that are remembered. Ah, I did that for you. You're, you're not going to even tell me thank you. See, this is the point. Wordsworth says the most important acts you ever commit are the acts that no one ever says thank you for. They're never going to come up to you and go, yay, you did something really great for me. I appreciate it. No, 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 no. The most important acts in your life will be acts you commit. No one will ever even know it was a gift. Which suggests the only true gifts of your life are the ones you give yourself. You'll not receive them. You give them to yourself by virtue of your own actions. What an interesting <laughs> argument. It is those little nameless, unremembered acts of kindness and of love that define your very existence, your very life. Wordsworth says, and again, this is an arguable thesis. We'll get to that part of it in a bit. Wordsworth says that when I start to feel lost, stuck in lonely rooms amid the den of towns and cities, I go back to this place in my mind, and it allows me to remember what really matters. It restores my mind to the things that matter. Got me? Keep going. Nor less I trust to them, them the forms, right? These images uh, in his mind. I may have owed another gift of aspect more sublime, that blessed mood. Now this is interesting. Leave me alone, I'm in a bad mood. Wordsworth says, I totally, I totally get it. Yeah, you are in a bad mood. Most of the time, if you choose it, you stay in a bad mood. Interesting. Wordsworth argues, as most romantics will, you choose your moods. They don't choose you. You choose to be in a bad mood. You choose to be sad. You choose to be depressed. You choose by virtue of your thoughts. Your thoughts determine how you feel. You choose those thoughts but most of us do it without realizing we're choosing those thoughts. Get up in the morning, oh, another gray day. It's going to be a crappy day. 
And then we're shocked that the rest of the day, everyone seems to respond to us and they're mean and we're in crappy moods and we're tired. Wordsworth says, I totally get it. He says, coming back to this place reminds me that I can define my own mood by virtue of reflection on this spot. Keep reading. He says that blessed mood in which the burden of the mystery, in which the heavy and the weary weight of all this unintelligible world is lightened. It's a powerful word picture. It's like Atlas having the world on your shoulders and you're going, uh, down, down, down. And he says, all of a sudden, that entire weight can be lightened by what? My heart leaps up when I behold a rainbow in the sky. It isn't big things. It's little things for romantics that are the insight to helping you get through today and then tomorrow and then the day after that and on and on. If you think it gets any easier as you age, sit down and have a conversation with the adults in your life who are older, okay? And they will say to you, it doesn't necessarily get any easier at all. Keep reading. That serene and blessed mood in which the affections gently lead us on until the breath of this corporal frame and even the motion of our human blood almost suspended. We are laid asleep in body and become a living soul. There's your platonic distinction between body and soul. While with an eye may quiet by the power of harmony. If, you, if this was your own book, I would have you circle that word. That's the key to the romantic vision. Harmony. Unity. You can see your life as dismembered, broken up into its various parts. Or you can see your life in some kind of harmony, some kind of unity. And he says, when I am out in nature, I have a tendency to see my life more harmonious. This sea that bears her bosom to the moon, the winds that will be howling at all hours and are gathered now like sleeping flowers. For this, for everything, we are out of tune. Harmony, it moves us not. It's foundational to understanding romanticism that they will say, you choose to have a crappy mood because you choose to allow for your guitar to become untuned, your piano to become untuned. Tune your piano, tune your guitar, your life will be better lived, you'll have better energy, you will have enthusiasm for the things that matter. If you don't, that's fine, walk into the propeller called life and see how it feels. It's inevitably going to feel painful, heavy, weary, weight. While with an eye made quiet by the power of harmony and the deep power of, and there's the other word, that is constantly going to be at the core, and you know this already because you read your Emerson and your Thoreau, it is that joy. Why is it some people seem to be happy all the time? I hate people like that. Really, Wordsworth says, I don't think so. I think you envy people like that. I don't think you hate people like that. No one wants to be in crappy moods. We don't choose that knowledgeably. We choose it because we don't know what else to do. Wordsworth says it's very simple. When you lose connection with nature, you begin to have less harmony, therefore less joy, therefore less energy or enthusiasm. Some of you will remember this is Thoreau's understanding of energy conservation is peace. You'll maybe remember our word picture on the whiteboard last year of that a um, gas can full of gas that gets those ice picks stuck into the side of it over and over again. We lose a lot of energy day after day after day. With some 40 school days remaining for us as seniors, some of us will report, I'm just really tired. <sighs> of course, I beg an intriguing question. So you do graduate. That's on a Sunday. The next day is called Monday. Not unlike any other Monday of your life. What do you think you're going to do on that Monday? Wake up and all of a sudden you're going to have all this new energy? Yay! See, that's the silliness of our childish minds that say, of course I'll have more energy. I will have graduated. You thought that way? You thought that way about eighth grade graduation too. That was a big dog deal that night when you got all dressed up in your doodads and got a photograph that got stuck on a wall that everyone laughs at now. <laughs> Don't worry, they'll laugh at this one as well that you're about to take. All of the primping and preparations, 
Someday you'll have totally forgotten your graduation from high school day. Guys, your energy isn't defined by your moments of graduation or not. If you find yourself fatigued right now, it ain't got nothing to do with the fact you're stuck in high school. It's got nothing to do with, for Wordsworth, the fact he was stuck in lonely rooms amid the den of towns and cities. It's the way you think. If you lack joy, you're choosing that. That is your choice. And Wordsworth says, what a tragedy. Because all of a sudden you turn around, as he'll say to Dorothy, and you're not young anymore. Ah! If you don't want to be a mean, nasty old person, don't be a mean, nasty young person. That's his point. You choose to decide how you expend your energies. It's up to you. He gets all of this. Finally, it's all about insight. Remember Plato and Republic? It's all about insight. Not outside. Insight. He says... When I have harmony, then I have joy. When I have joy, then I can see into the life of things. I can see, the, see things for what they really are. I mean, for Wordsworth, it's as simple as this. All you got to do is just go sit out there and look at Ruthie's tree for a while. And first, it'll look like a tree. And then all of a sudden, it'll begin to be a life force, energy. Energy it didn't create of its own. How did it know how to grow to look like that? And then all of a sudden it becomes personal. Well, that's true. I guess I, how do I know? How did I know how to grow to look like me? Where, what am I? In what ways am I very similar to Ruthie's tree? We're both energy, not of our own construction, not of our own making. And yet somehow we exist, but just for a short period of time. That's the point of Ruthie's tree as well. No tree gets to live forever. No you gets to live forever, at least in this present form. Wordsworth says, I can see into the life of all of that, and then all of a sudden my life is completely different. I totally see my life differently. We're only through the first part of the essay, poetic essay. He is aware, Wordsworth, he is aware that there's any number of skeptics, they're called neoclassical, who are going to roll their eyes and go, really? Rainbows. You're telling me the answer to my crappy life is rainbows or Ruthie's tree. Really? Wordsworth will say, I'm aware that you are maybe a little bit of a skeptic. So he will pause here. If this be but a vain belief, vain here means stupid. In other words, he's aware that people are gonna call him a tree hugger and laugh at him. It's a wonderful argument though. Yet, oh, how oft in darkness and amid the many shapes of joyless daylight, when the fretful stir unprofitable and the, fear of the fever of the world have hung upon the beatings of my heart when I'm having a crappy day, how oft in spirit have I turned to thee, O Sylvan, why? That's that lake, uh, that's that river we just saw. That wanderer through the woods. How often has my spirit turned to thee? It's an interesting argument. He says, okay, I may be totally wrong about this. And you may be right. And the whole world is nothing but crappy. And, and everybody's got to die. And so it's depressing anyway. And so what's the point of having any joy? He says, you may be totally right. I may be totally wrong. But I don't think so. And here's why. When the world is really crappy, I'm the one that smiles, not you. I win, you lose. And you choose it that way. And he says, the only reason I can do this is because I have some capacity to be able to see the value of this place that I am, this 10 turn Abbey place, which you can have as well, if only you would. Now to turn to the final, or the next step of the poem. Present. We've moved from the past now to the present. And now, with gleams of half extinguished thought, with many recognitions dim and faint, and somewhat of a sad perplexity, that's an important line, when you start to see into the life of things, you have joy, but you also have sadness. Part of it is, and some of you will begin to feel this, if you ever do really catch a glimpse, you go, crap, I wasted a lot of my high school. <laughs> that was dumb. And immediately you kind of have this sad, <sighs> that's, kind of a, that's kind of a bummer. See, that's the, that's the way it works. You're liberated because you see, but you're also depressed because you do see. You're like, jeez. I wasted, you know, that was dumb. The picture of the mind revives again while here I stand, not only with the sense of present pleasure, but with pleasing thoughts that in this moment there is life and food for future years. It's an interesting argument. All you need is just a couple of really good moments in your life to get through all your life. Why? Because you can come back to those moments over and over and over again. Being at Tenter and Abbey has been that for Wordsworth. The next line, of course, is pure romanticism. I love the verb, and so I dare to hope. Hoping is daring. It takes a risk. It's a gamble that pays off. Though changed no doubt from what I was when first I came among these hills. Uh-oh. 
Here it comes for those of you that grew up out here. You know this all too well when you were young. They all threw you in the vehicle. Off you have to drive to some magic place in the mountains, which seems to take for friggin' ever to get. Are we there yet? No. Are we there yet? No. Are we there yet? Finally, we get there. Notice the difference in the age versus you thing, right? The doors come open really fast. Out you jumped as a kid. Run, 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 right? How did the adults get out of the vehicle? Slow. Oh, smell the air. Oh, they're always wanting to point things out. Look at the beautiful, right? The kids, pew, pew. <laughs> right? Adults are ready to start qualifying all this beauty. Kids, they don't need to be told. They know it's incredible. That's why they jump out and start running, 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 running. He says, I remember back when I was a kid in the mountains. Look at what he says. He says, when like... Uh, I bounded o'er the mountains by this like a row. I bounded o'er the mountains by the deep rivers and the lonely streams wherever nature fled. More like a man flying from something that he dreads than when he sought the thing he loved. For nature then, and then look what he says about being young. The coarser pleasures of my boyish days and their glad animal movements all gone by. In other words, he says, I'm an old fart now. I'm not young anymore. To me, he says, back then nature was all in all. And then he says something interesting that you can immediately catch sight of if you look at your third grade picture. He says... I cannot paint what then I was. Who were you as a freshman? Go back and look at the picture. You, you know that it's you, but you have this tendency to kind of go, I can't, I can't really remember much of what I was like back then. I start to forget how quickly we forget what we were. The sounding cat or economy like a passion, the tall rock, the mountain, the deep and the gloomy word, the colors, their forms, notice forms again, were then to me an appetite, a feeling and a love that had no need of a remoter charm by thought supplied nor any interest unborrowed from the eye. When I was a young kid, I didn't have to think about the mountains being amazing. I just were in them and I enjoyed them. But he says it, that time has passed. I'm old now. Look what he says about ninth graders. And all its aching joys are now no more. And all its dizzy raptures. I try and have these conversations with freshmen and they just laugh at me. And I say, hey, in the next 40 days of school, there will be seniors who will go out, two beautiful, beautiful bodies, and they will go out and they will stay out all night and all they'll do is talk. There will be no exchange of fluids, they'll just talk. And my freshmen just laugh at me, yeah, right, whatever. I'm like, no, I'm serious. And the reason is simple, it's because they're seniors and they realize they don't have much time left, so they're gonna enjoy being together. My freshmen have no clue. They couldn't have any flu, dizzy. They're like tops, right? By the time you hit your senior year, you start to become a little more reflective. I don't have much time left. And everything starts to kind of slow down a little bit, you know, as you get older. He keeps going with that notion. He says, uh, not for this faint eye. I don't want to go back, he says. I don't want to go back and be young again. Nor more, nor murmur. Other gifts have followed. For such less, I, I would believe, abundant recompense. I lost something getting old, he says, but I gained something too. Really, what did you gain? Somebody once told me when I was your age, listen to what old farts have to say. You may learn something. You know, somebody maybe said that to you. What, what does he gain? I have learned to look on nature, not as in the hour of freshmen, thoughtless youth, but hearing oftentimes the still sad music of humanity, nor harsh, nor grating, though of ample power to chasten and subdue. And I have felt a presence that disturbs me with the joy of elevated thoughts. See, I'm back to my comments with my ninth grader. No, no, they'll just sit up all night and talk. Talk about what? Especially if they're two hot people. They, they don't need to exchange fluids. It's, they're way beyond that. Well, what are they going to do? Well, they're going to talk. Talk about what? Elevated thoughts. Well, I don't even know what you're talking about. Oh, I know. I know you don't. But that's because you're a stupid freshman. Trust me, in three years, you'll start to figure it out. And then you'll go, oh. Thanks, guys. Come back tomorrow.